my pleasure this morning uh, to have this opportunity to talk to you. And what I want to do is just explore how we might make a science space uh, for, for deep learning. And, and I thought I would start out by, by mentioning that AlexNet uh, was, was very successful. And uh, a number of people have taken the technology and applied it to different problems, uh, with also with great success. But we know very little about why it works. And that shouldn't really bother you, because that's how engineering uh, proceeds. Uh, we learned how to make airplanes fly before we really understood aerodynamics. Then we developed the theory of aerodynamics to make planes fly better. And the same with internal combustion. And uh, deep learning is, is having a tremendous impact, uh, but there's very little uh, research explaining why. And so this may be the time to develop a theory uh, supporting deep learning. And I, I'm particularly interested in it uh, because it's very hard to teach a course uh, if what the material you have is all experimental. Uh, it's much easier to teach if there's an underlying theory, and, and that's the material you can teach. So I thought I'm just going to have a, a few different things that one might explore uh, to develop a theory. Uh, but to start out, I, as you all know, you can take an image of a cat, and you can change just a few pixels, as I did here, and you may not recognize that, but that's now an automobile. And uh, basically what you can do is you can make any minor change to an image, uh, a minor change to any image, and change its classification to an arbitrary classification. And the question is, why can you do that? And I suspect that it has to do with high dimensional space. So uh, imagine trying to partition space into 100 categories, so that with high probability, that if you pick any point in one category, it's very close to a point in each of the other 99 categories. Now, in two dimensions, not very likely that you could do that. Um, I guess I have to put some restrictions on uh, how I'm going to allow you to carve the space up. Because if you took two dimensions and said, I'm going to have the rationals in one category, the irrationals in the other, uh, any point you pick is close to a point in the other category. But I'm going to require that you separate the categories by hyperplanes. Uh, but the reason you might be able to do it in high dimensions is high dimensions is fundamentally different. And so I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, high dimensional space. Uh, one can take a unit sphere and uh, you can, uh, in, in high dimension, and you can partition it into many categories. So that with high probability, if you select a point in one category, it's very close to each of the other categories. And this may be uh, what is allowing fooling to take place, and so maybe we better understand high dimensions. And I thought I would put a few slides on just to illustrate high dimensions. See, your intuition about space was probably in, evolved from two and three dimensions, and there things are fundamentally different. Uh, so here, I've got a sphere in high dimensions, and I want to calculate the volume of it. So what I do is I divide it up into little cubes, and these cubes are d-dimensional cubes. And if I know the volume of each cube and how many cubes there are, then I know the volume of the sphere. So let's say I take that sphere and I shrink it by one minus epsilon. Well, what I would do is I would shrink each of the little cubes, and if you calculate the volume of this smaller sphere, you'll notice that each cube, its dimensions are less than, have 
is one minus epsilon, and if you raise that to a high number, like dimension is 100, that goes to zero. So there's no volume in that inner sphere. And that says that all of the volume of the sphere is close to the surface. And this is true not just for a sphere, it's true for any object in, in high dimensions. Uh, but let me point out something else. All of the volume being close to the sphere, why don't you pick a point on the surface of the sphere and call that the North Pole? And that will define an equator. It turns out that all of the volume is also on the equator. Um, but you could have picked the North Pole anywhere you wanted, and that would give you a different equator, and all of the volume is on that equator. And what you could also do is take a little cube, um, a one by one cube. Now the radius of the sphere is one, so that cube uh, from the center out to an edge is a half. And so you can see that the cube looks like it's sitting inside there, and all of the volume is inside that cube. And you might start wondering, how can these things be? Um, since I don't have too much time, I'll, I'll just explain one. I'll explain why all of the volume can be at the surface and at the same time at the equator. That equator is, is really a circular cylinder. So it looks something like that. And the surface, the upper surface of that cylinder is, is a sphere in d minus one dimensions, so all of its volume is at the edge. And now you can see if you combine, look at that uh, equator, that cylinder, and you look at the sphere, uh, you can see that in d minus one dimensions, the area where the volume is overlaps. Um, so it's interesting to look at that, but what I wanted to do is look at a random point. Uh, if you pick a random point, um, it's going to be close to the equator, and that says that, that there's not going to be any coordinate which is large. Roughly, they're all going to be equal. Um, and if I'm going to classify points uh, by which coordinate is largest. So let's say I pick a point in the first category. So that's 1 over square root d plus epsilon. And let's say I want to find a point in the second category, which is close. Well, notice I, all I have to do is shrink the first epsilon and take the second coordinate and make it slightly bigger, and I've moved you from one category to another. And so understanding um, the uh, high dimensions may help you understand and uh, determine something about fooling. Uh, but the, the current state of research um, is, is really experimental. Um, and uh, what I would like to do is find a way to develop a theory. And um, there is one thing I'm going to show you, just one experiment that we were doing, uh, that led to a suggestion how you might develop a theory. Um, I talked to a number of researchers, and they were talking about images of cats, and they talked about something called the cat manifold. And I'll, I'll tell you about manifolds in just a minute. Uh, but they said the cat manifold is low dimension. And so I wondered, what dimension is it? And, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, but let me first uh, talk a little bit about the structure of, of AlexNet. Um, so AlexNet takes a picture, and at the first level it takes a three by three window, and it slides that window across the picture and, and down. And for each location there is a gate, and those gates have the same weights. And so you make a new version of the image where you extract some feature. And you want to extract many features, so you have many of these. And then, uh, to try to keep the network small, uh, you have another level which is called pooling, where you have a two-by-two two window. And here, uh, you slide the two-by-two the two window uh, two units at a time, so it doesn't overlap. Uh, 
and you simply take the maximum value and put that uh, into, in other words, you shrink the picture by a factor of two in two dimensions. Now, now you might think you're throwing away some information, but if, if you're finding features, it's not that critical exactly where the features are. Uh, what is critical is what is the relation to, to the various features. So you haven't really thrown away much information. Now, Alex, AlexNet had five convolutional levels, and then three fully connected, and then softmax. And I think I'm going to just play a little with this uh, so that everybody will be on board. Uh, we talk about something called activation space. So when you put an, an image in here at the first level, I'm going to create a vector, uh, maybe at the first level or second level, third level, where the coordinates of that vector have the value of the gates, the output of the gates. And I'm going to call this, uh, these set of vectors activation space. And this is what researchers were talking about. If you take the manifold of all cat images, it will create a manifold in activation space. And that was the manifold I wanted to find the dimension of. But just to show you a little bit about activation space, if you take an image, uh, you can very quickly find the vector in activation space corresponding to that image. But what, what if I gave you an activation vector and asked what, what image produced that vector. Now, there are many ways to do this. I'm going to give one which is simple to explain. I'm going to take a random image, and I'm going to find the activation vector for that random image. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a gradient descent on the pixels of the random image to move the activation vector of the random image up to the activation vector whose image I want to find. And what that will do is that will convert the random image to the image which produced that uh, activation vector. Okay, uh, so what people do with this, um, what you might do is take the activation vector at an early level and call that the content of the image. And you might take the activation vectors at the other end and call that the style. And the reason that we take the, the content early is if you're training this network, uh, you're throwing away content unless it's relative to the classification. And uh, so it just seems a little bit better to take this first vector to be the content. Now, what I can do, as from the previous slide, is if I have the content of an image and the style of the image, I can recreate the image. But I don't have to use the style of the image that I was working with. So just, just to illustrate that, um, take a picture of one of our former presidents and put it into AlexNet, take the activation vector which corresponds to the content of that image, but then we took 200 images of older people. And we looked, we looked at the content of each of those and averaged them together. And then what we did is we recreated this image the way it would look if the president was 20 years older. Okay, very, very, very uh, simple thing. Um, it turns out that what I do is uh, I typically bring 30 students from China over to Cornell for a month uh, to expose them to an American university. And during that month, uh, the students have to do something, maybe work on a research project. And one of them heard uh, what I just said here about recreating uh, our president if he was 20 years older. And what this student did 
is they took a, they took a picture of Cornell University. Uh, fed that into AlexNet and looked at the activation vector that gave the content of that. But then he said, what would Cornell University look like if it was located in China? So he took a, a piece of Asian artwork, uh, used that for the style, and then said, this is what Cornell would look like if it was located in, in China. Uh, th this was uh, someone who had just finished his junior year, uh, had never done anything in deep learning, uh, and had to do something within four weeks. Uh, so uh, that's there. But other researchers have, lots of researchers have done this, and they did it before we did. Um, but one of the questions, do you even have to train the network to carry out experiments like this? And it turns out you don't. Um, if you start with random weights, you can carry out this experiment and it works just as well as if you have a trained network. Now what this does is it raises a question. Uh, what kinds of things can you do that, require, that don't require training? Uh, for example, if you could determine how well an architecture would work without training the architecture, uh, then you could work at exploring uh, good architectures uh, because you could test an architecture with just maybe a minute of computing power uh, instead of several, several weeks. So these, these are interesting things to explore. Um, but I want to come back to the question uh, that gave us some insight as to how we might produce a theory or how we might get started. Um, I, if I gave you a bunch of points in two dimensions and asked, did these points come from a one-dimensional manifold or are they two-dimensional, there's absolutely no way you could tell unless I gave you a large number of points and they were close together. If I just gave you those three points that are on the slide, uh, there are many one-dimensional curves you could put through, and um, you, you couldn't tell me what manifold they came from. It's, it wouldn't even be a, a, a meaningful question. So <clears throat> I'm back to asking, what is the dimension of the cat manifold? Now, the difficulty that I had is I had a thousand cat images. And so what I had is I had a thousand activation vectors uh, in 10,000 dimensional space. And unfortunately, these vectors were far apart. And um, I asked myself, well, <laughs> there's all kinds of manifolds they can come from. How am I, how am I gonna find the dimension of the manifold? Uh, so what we did is um, we took one cat image and we created thousands of versions of it by just adding random noise and modifying that image just very slightly. And this gave me a large number of activation vectors that were all in a, in a little ball. Uh, and then what I did is I pushed a hyperplane up against it so it would be tangent. And I asked what dimension hyperplane can I push up against it and use this to determine the dimension of the, of the cat manifold. Uh, first thing I had to do, though, is I had to do a singular value decomposition uh, because it, it's, it wasn't precisely what the dimension of that uh, uh, hyperplane was going to be. Uh, but roughly, we, we guessed that the um, manifold was about 200 dimensions. Uh, but there are problems. We were nervous about this uh, because maybe we didn't determine the dimension of the cat manifold. What we did is we determined the dimension of the process we used to modify the pictures. And it was at this point that I realized, and here's the, the one message that I wanted to get across to researchers, that the problem is that we don't have a mathematical definition 
of what images, which images are cats. So this suggests why don't we create some new categories of images where we have mathematical definitions of the categories. Because if you had categories where you have a mathematical definition, uh, then you would have a mathematical way of calculating the actual manifolds at various levels in the network. And I think that this idea is one which will allow researchers to start proving theoretical things about deep learning. And, and that's the main message that I wanted to get across. Uh, but let's go in, how are we going to create categories? So uh, one, one thing that I decided is maybe I would take a T and I would look at the lower part of the T that comes down and the left hand side and assign XY coordinates. And then for any value of XY, I'll get a T. And basically I'm moving that T around uh, in the, the network. And so now I have a two dimensional category of T's uh, and actually it's, it's a vector space. And what you can do is you can take this image, by the way, and take each row and concatenate the rows so you have a vector. Uh, so these are really vectors and, and you can take that convolutional level and make a vector out of that little window. And that's really what this convolution is. You're taking the convolution of two vectors. And um, so this gave me a, a two dimensional uh, category. But what you could do is you could change the size, that would give you three dimensions, and you could start doing other things. So, um, what, what I would like to do um, is find um, a much higher dimensional space. Uh, I would like to find a category of dimension 200. Uh, the reason I want 200 is my guess is that the cat category of cats is of dimension about 200. Okay, and then I would suggest the following experiment. Suppose you created two categories, uh, C1 and C2. What I would want to do first is uh, train AlexNet using the images for cat and dog and then train another copy of AlexNet uh, using your categories of images. And the reason I want to do this is I want to make sure that in some sense your images represent actual experimental images. And so I would train both uh, networks and I would ask questions like, uh, does it take the same length of time to train? Uh, is the generalization approximately the same? Does fooling work approximately the same? Uh, because I want to make sure that my categories aren't so simplistic uh, that I'm proving something about a mathematical model which doesn't capture the, the real model at all. Um, and the model that I've given you obviously doesn't capture it uh, because I have vector spaces and I offset them from the origin so they're affine spaces and they're going to be linearly separable. So, so that's not good. Uh, so one of the things I want, um, I, I don't want the categories to be vector spaces, I want them to be manifolds of a dimension 200. And what you could do is you could take a hyperplane and simply fold it into a sphere that would give you a manifold of the right dimension. Um, I don't think that that's the right thing to do uh, because your category then uh, would be convex. And separating convex categories is probably much easier uh, than uh, separating the categories of cat and dog. So one of the issues we, we're starting to think about maybe one of you will come up with it, is how do I make a manifold 
which is in some way represents the manifolds uh, that we get uh, when we're dealing with real data. Uh, because if, if we had such manifolds, then possibly we have the basis for developing a theory. Uh, the, the key thing is I want a mathematical definition of my data, and, and then I, I, I can work from that. So I thought what I would do is I would just talk about a few other ideas where we might be able to develop theory. Uh, because maybe we can take little things we do in deep learning and figure out why they work and, and maybe prove theorems about them. Uh, so one of the, the first things I'm going to do um, is I'm going to look at how we train a network. What we do is we create an error function uh, where this uh, error function tells us how far the output of the network is from the true classification. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put in images and I'm going to take derivatives of the weights in the network and try to adjust the weights to correctly classify all the images. Now, one thing that, that is interesting um, is that the error function, uh, if you have 100,000 images, the error function has a term for each image. So you have a function which is a summation of 100,000 terms, and you may have a million weights, and you're going to take a derivative of this 100,000 terms with each of these million parameters, and that's going to take a lot of time. So people in scientific computing will say, uh, why don't you do stochastic gradient descent rather than full gradient descent? And what stochastic gradient descent uh, does uh, is instead of trying to reduce this, um, this error function with 100,000 terms in it, why don't we randomly select one term? What, that, that's the equivalent of selecting one image. And let's take the derivative of these uh, million weights uh, for that one image and correct the weights. Then randomly select another image and correct the weights. And just randomly select images, one at a time. And if this works, uh, this will maybe speed up the process by a factor of 10,000. Okay, it's, it's because taking the derivative is so much simpler. Uh, but what surprised me is if you do this, by the way, it does work and it is much faster, it's 10,000 times faster. But not only that, it gives you a much better local minimum. And the question is why? So what you could do is you could create a, a uh, mathematical version of this and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look, uh, say, in two dimensions. Uh, let's say this was the error function for one image. And, and I just simplified this Im immensely so that I can get the idea across. And I'm going to have 100,000 pictures like this. But what's going to be different is the vertex where these lines meet is going to be randomly placed. Uh, so the pictures will look like this, but they won't be identical. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this 100,000 of these together and see what I get. So what I get is a picture like that. Okay. Now notice that if you're doing full gradient descent, uh, let's say I start over here at a at a thousand. Uh, here my I only have one weight weight vector so to get it down to be one dimension. If I start at a thousand and start doing gradient descent, I'm going to move down this curve, and you'll notice that at about 700, I'm going to get stuck in a local minimum. 
okay? Now, you could develop a method, I'm sure uh, scientific computing people know how to get out of that local minimum and, and, and do better. Uh, but let me show you why stochastic gradient descent works. Um, if I'm somewhere on this, uh, my weight vector is somewhere here, and I pick a random image, and I correct my weight vector, I'm likely to move into this region where there's a large number of local minima, but they're much better. Uh, not always going to move that direction. Occasionally, I'm going to get an image which moves me out. But if 999 images out of 1,000 move me towards the center, uh, I'm, I'm going to get down into that good region. And so what you're going to see is <clears throat> as you're running your uh, stochastic gradient descent, you're going to be moving around between 200 and 600, something like that. And once you get in this region where you're just sort of moving around, um, what you might do is instead of taking one image, you might take 50. And now you have an error function with 50 terms. And what that does is that reduces the variance, and you'll be in a, in a smaller region. Uh, and finally, when you get happy, uh, what you will do is uh, switch to full gradient descent, and, and you'll get into one of these local minima. Okay. Um, now, what this suggests is it would be very important to study, and I, and I know people in scientific computing have done this, um, is really how to do gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, uh, for various error functions, and to understand what the structure of the error function is uh, in deep learning. Uh, because there, there are many things you might do uh, if you had a, a, a long, narrow valley, which just had a little slope going down, what you would do with gradient descent is you would rock back and forth across this valley and slowly move down. So what people do is they do something, they introduce a concept of momentum. Uh, instead of correcting the error function, uh, they correct the momentum and then use the momentum to correct the error function. And what the momentum does is in this motion back and forth, that averages out and you go down the valley much faster. Uh, but there's many things like this to study. Um, one of the questions is, do you even want to go down that valley? Uh, because if you're very close down, um, uh, are you overfitting your data when you do that? And, and these are questions you can ask and you could develop a little bit of a theory. Uh, and what, what I just want to say is that there are many areas like this uh, where, where um, you can pull out these little problems and, and work on them. Uh, I'll talk about one more, but I, I want to just emphasize what I think is the most important thing that, that I've said. And that is, if you could create a mathematical version of uh, deep learning, and by a mathematical version, I mean if you could create a categories of images where you had a mathematical definition of them, then, then I think that there are many things you could explore. You could explore fooling, you could explore various things. Uh, having said that, I'm gonna pick one more topic. Uh, when my daughter was two or three years old, uh, I had a book called The Best Word Book Ever. And this is, is a great book to sit on a couch with your, your child and you go through it. It's, it's just a book full of pictures. And you po point at a picture and say cat, dog, house, tree, airplane, so forth. And after you do this for a few days, Pretty soon you can go through the book and point at the pictures and your child will say cat, dog, tree, house, etc. Uh, it's, it's interesting that I, I run several centers in China 
And uh, if a faculty member that I've hired, um, uh, if she or if it's a he and his spouse have a child, uh, what I do is I give them a book of a copy of the best word book ever. Uh, and what they do is they realize that you can do this in two languages. Uh, the reason that's important uh, is if you learn two languages as a child, uh, we now know that there is one position in the brain which will handle both languages. But if you learn a second language as an adult, there are two separate positions in the brain, one, say, for English and the other for Mandarin, and what is apparently happening is you're translating back and forth, and that's why it's a lot harder to, to talk in a language which is not your natural uh, language. Uh, but the reason I put this book up, one of them, uh, is there's only one picture of a fire engine. It's on the cover. And from that one picture, my daughter learned to identify fire engines. Uh, one day we were out for a walk, and uh, there was a fire engine on the street. And that doesn't look, let me just back up, that doesn't look that much like the one in the book. Uh, but she was able to learn the category of fire engine from a single image. Uh, what we're doing in deep learning is we're learning a cat from a thousand images. And how, how do we learn from one image? Um, and I think it's, it's important to ask questions like this and try to figure out uh, what you would do. Um, when I mentioned this, someone said to me, um, your daughter had seen billions of images before she sat down with that book, and maybe she learned from images how to classify them so that when she saw just one, she knew what category. Uh, so there might be several ways that might happen, and so let me just try one and see, see what we might do. Um, when I train my deep network, rather than train it for all thousand categories of images, why don't I partition the images into animal, plant, physical object, and other high-level categories? And initially, I'm simply going to train whether the image is an animal, plant, or physical object. I'm, I'm not going to train the whole network. Uh, then I'm going to move down a level, and for example, animal, I'll then train into cat, dog, or, or horse. And the tree would, is going to be deeper. I just made this simple so you understand it. Now, suppose you have an image uh, which is an elephant. What's going to happen? Uh, I hope that your network is such that the elephant will at least be called an animal, and then it will compare that elephant to the small number of categories, and notice that it's not close to any of them. And so then you can say, this is a new category, and with one image, I created a new category. And my hope is, is that if you show it another elephant sometime, it will get it into the right category. Uh, but, but this isn't necessarily the way things happen, but there's many ways like this that you can develop simple mathematical problems and uh, possibly understand how we do these things. And this particular uh, issue is important uh, because if, if deep learning is what's going to drive your automobile, uh, you're not going to be able to program in every situation the automobile is going to see uh, before you let it go loose on the road. And what you would really like is as the automobile is driving you around, that it's learning to drive better just, just the way that, that you are. Um, but, but with that, what I hope I've done is that I've been able to, to uh, get across how you might start developing some mathematical content. And the reason I'm going to appreciate what you did 
uh, is it's going to make it much easier for me to teach. And, and I also think that once we know the mathematical theory, uh, we'll be able to make uh, deep learning work much better. So with that, I'd like to just thank you for giving me this opportunity. So, thank you for this wonderful talk. Are there questions? So with the last slide where you were showing the higher level categories and then the tree, do you think this corresponds with respect to your first question about the division of space to sort of a multi-layered division where your first division corresponding to the higher level categories has sort of larger spaces but fewer of them in high dimensional Euclidean space so that later when you have the greater stratification, a small perturbation might take you to a different sub-level category but right. won't move you. So is that the basic idea? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer, uh, but I think one of the things of getting away from fooling uh, is having, being able to extract certain features of categories uh, and trying to preserve those rather than actually the category itself. And, and I think your question is really related to that. Um, but I, I don't know the answer, so I have to apologize. Yeah. So, thank you for your nice talk. I want to ask, uh, just uh, learning from image, if we use text as well as audio, means uh, complete three things together, image, text, and audio, then it would be better to learn the classification in single shot, that single image. Okay, I, I didn't quite catch it. Could you try that one more time, just? Uh, with an image, if we use text uh, associated with that image, and audio attached to that image, then these three things together can learn uh, things faster in single uh, shot. So you, you say, given an image, you're talking about an activation vector? Yeah. Means yeah. And then? Activation vector for? Oh. Hmm. oh. Oh, yes, I, I, I'm sure the answer is, is yes, that it's, it's got to be, yeah. And, and there's just, by the way, I, I tend to focus just on images, but there's a whole, just, a, just as big, if not bigger, set of research on text and language, uh, because that's so important, and how to, from a, a sentence, to create the corresponding image and so forth, yeah. Thank you very much for the lecture. My question is on what is really the difference between uh, machine learning and deep learning? Just uh, last, uh, in July, I partake in one global uh, internship. We use uh, random forest and, uh, and decision tree to treat a problem of company attrition but I don't really get the major difference between machine learning and uh, deep learning. Is machine learning oh. an algorithm inside deep learning or are they different entities? Oh, so, so you're asking what is the difference between yeah. deep learning and machine learning? Yes. Uh, deep learning is just one narrow piece of, of machine learning. And, and the reason I just talked about deep learning solely uh, is, is because it has been very effective uh, the fact that AlexNet, there was such a tremendous improvement and, and people then used it in many applications and it seemed to work. Uh, but it's, it's just one narrow piece of it. Um, and I, I guess what I should do is, is caution you a little um, that in deep learning, what we're really looking at is the structure of an image. Uh, so if you train deep learning to recognize bicycles, 
And then you show it something that looks like a bicycle but doesn't have the function of a bicycle. Uh, it's still going to call it a bicycle, whereas you would say it's something else. Uh, one of the examples I use is um, if you trained your network to recognize railroad cars and engines, uh, and then you showed it a picture of an engine that they now use in switchyards, which has no cab for, the, for someone to sit in to control it, it would probably say it was a boxcar or it was a flat car with something sitting on it, whereas a human might notice that there's motors on the wheels and say, hmm, that's a remote controlled engine. <laughs> it doesn't need a person to, to run it. Um, I mean, they're just, just fantastic things, but at this stage, all we're doing is looking at the structure of images. And um, I have a slide, I don't have it here, where I showed the various revolutions in human existence, the agricultural revolution, the industrial, and they're coming 10 times faster. And the last one from industrial to information is 400 years, so there'll be another revolution in 40 years. And people ask me what that revolution is going to be. And my guess it will, is that we'll start, uh, AI will start being able to understand function and then do much higher level things than, than we can do with just pictures. Thank you. Yeah, good. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I had a question about the minimizing the loss function while also avoiding overfitting. It seems like there's this inherent catch-22 in deep learning in general because you want to train something as well as possible, but you also don't want to go too well because once you get this 100% accuracy, you have a problem going on. Right. So is there a way to rationalize this better with this higher dimensional concept that you're talking about in this talk? Or any comments on that? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think maybe on the next talk, you might learn something about this. Uh, some people in scientific computing uh, for a long time uh, have studied uh, gradient descent and learning and, and overfitting, and they, they know much more. But I, I don't think that there's anything that I said that would contribute to helping you with that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the insightful talk. Um, you started talking about adversarial examples and then connected it a bit to what kind of manifold and representation we actually learn. And I've been studying that a bit, and um, personally I'm, I have the impression that it's very connected in the sense that if we learn a good manifold, then we wouldn't have these problems like adversarial examples and, and similar cases. Um, so what do you think? Is that interconnected? So do adversarial examples live on our manifold or, for example, CAD images, and it's only a problem of learning the manifold probably, or are adversarial examples part of a, uh, of a bigger problem? Uh, so one of the things, I don't really know what the shape of the manifold is, but I suspect it is nowhere near something that is convex. And whether it just has a bunch of arms sticking out, or whether they bend around, and whether cats and dogs, are, you know. Uh, but one thing that's interesting uh, is if you train a network and look at the manifold at the various levels, uh, as it goes along, you must be untangling these manifolds and probably getting them into reasonably close to convex so that they can be linearly separable. Um, so one thing, uh, it's, it's a little embarrassing when you ask questions because I don't know the answers to any of them. Uh, all I know is there's an incredible range of exciting problems uh, that people could work on and make progress. Yeah, thank you. Great. I'd love to Thanks. piggyback on that, but I'll come back later. Thank you. Okay, we, we had a lot of questions. Uh, let's thank the speaker. Mm -hmm.